Thank you, Jenny. Um, for our first webinar of 2021, we are thrilled to welcome Professor Vipin Kumar, who is a Regents Professor holding the Williams Norris Chair in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Minnesota. His research interests include data mining, high performance computing, and the applications in climate, ecosystems, and healthcare. He also served as the Director of Army High Performance Computing Research Center from 1998 to 2005. Notable achievements include the development of the concept of ISO efficiency metric for evaluating the scalability of parallel algorithm, as well as highly efficient parallel algorithm and software for sparse matrix factorization and graph partitioning. He has authored over 300 research articles and credited or co-authored 10 books, including the widely used textbooks Introduction to Parallel Computing and Introduction to Data Mining. Professor Kumar's current major research focus is on bringing the power of big data and machine learning to understand the impact of hu human-induced changes on the Earth and its environment. His research on the topic is funded by NSF Big Data, Infuse, and HDR programs, as well as DARPA and USGS. Um, Listing his awards would take too much time, but he's a fellow of the ACM, IEEE, AAAS, and CM. Uh, and his foundational research in data mining and high-performance computing has been honored by many awards, including the ACM CKDD 2012 Innovation Award, as well as uh, the 2016 IEEE Computer Society Sydney Fernbot Award. Um, and today, Professor Vipin Kumar will talk about a field he helped co-found, which is physics-guided machine learning, a new framework for accelerating scientific discovery. And with that, thank you so much for joining us today, and um, I look forward to your webinar. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Jenny, for inviting me. So as Tom said, this uh, talk is about how do you bring the, the, the physics, the scientific knowledge, and the machine learning together. And of course, the motivation is that we are un under the age of uh, revolution of data. Uh, it's changing everything we do in our life. And, uh, and, and, and the key question is, can the technology that has revolutionized every aspect of our life can also speed up, could accelerate the process of discoveries in scientific disciplines and increasingly uh, machine learning, data mining, uh, the field of big data is being used uh, as, as, a, as a potentially very powerful tool. And, and this seminar, this webinar is an example of that, uh, one of the many examples of this. However, uh, many people from the scientific domain also find out oftentimes that when they use the standard black box method that have done so well in other domains, seem to sort of break down or provide very disappointing results when they apply to scientific domains. And there are many reasons for that. One of them is that these very complex uh, and very powerful methods, many of them based upon deep learning framework that have been developed in the last 10 years are data hungry. Uh, they're very large models, very complex models, so they can easily overfit the data unless you have lots of data. And in many scientific domains don't have as much data as, as, as needed uh, for these complex models. Because these models are uh, looking for statistical relationships, trying to optimize some sort of a cost function. They are not aware of the fact that the, the data that you're sort of trying to work with is, is, part, is coming from a physical system that needs to follow certain laws. And, and, and as a result, the results produced can be physically inconsistent. And for the very similar reason, uh, they can only, because they can only find relationships to the data that's given to, for training, they uh, can, they can fail to generalize to unseen scenarios, see scenarios that are very different than the ones that were used in the training set. And above all, uh, they, uh, if, even if machine learning algorithms do really well, uh, they uh, are not necessarily advancing science. They are probably improving the predictability, but not necessarily in, you know, improving the, uh, the, creating the next layer of science on which you can build the next, next big thing. And there are many examples uh, of failures. Uh, I'll just, you know, sort of with that, I'll sort of move on to the fact that there are two uh, different sort of modes of uh, operation we can see here. Uh, on one end is the data science models that use very little theory uh, from, from uh, and then as long as you have a lot of data, they can build, find relationship in them and do amazingly well. 
an, an example of that would be like language translation without having any understanding of linguistic theories just by using trillions and trillions of sentences that are available on the web in different languages. It's very easy to, to do the translation from one language to other without understanding anything. On the other hand, you have models that are based upon scientific theory. They do use data, but, but they don't need as much data. They rely a lot, on, lot more on the scientific theories. Uh, but because the scientific theories can be incomplete and, and uh, have limitations because they are only approximations of the reality, uh, they don't do as well unless, of course, your theory, uh, unless you, your theories are much more complete. So we have this situation in which if you have a lot of scientific knowledge, you're okay with the traditional paradigm. If you have lots of data, you're okay with the, the state-of-the-art machine learning algorithm. But, but there are a lot of situations which sort of fall in between, and that is sort of the focus of the talk. That is, can we build data science models that are guided by scientific theories that are not just plainly relying upon large data, but, but are leveraging the, the scientific knowledge that has been built over decades and centuries um, over time. Now, this field, of course, um, <clears throat> this direction has gained a lot of attention over the past uh, many, many years. Uh, and you know, in, in a, you can see some of the early papers going back as, as far back as six and seven years. Uh, but okay, uh, many, many people have been thinking about it. And this direction is also sort of being talked about by people as you know, theory guided, physics guided, knowledge guided, physics informed, physics available. And again, different people are sort of giving different names. But in some sense, they're all sort of talking about something very similar that is uh, you're trying to bring in the scientific knowledge into the machine learning paradigm. So, you know, Mike doesn't call it knowledge guided machine learning paradigm. It's applicable to nearly every scientific domain that you can think of. And the, the field has become so popular. I mean, this area of, 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 of scientific discipline has become so popular that we just, you know, did a survey just a few months ago of the work. It turned out there were about 300 papers published in just the last few years on this topic, on the topic of integrating physics based modeling with machine learning. There are uh, uh, agencies like DOE and NSF and DARPA that have programs in this area. There are workshops, and I list here only a very small subset of them um, uh, that sort of are focused exclusively on this. And so, so basically, the question is: Can we? Um, uh, the, the purpose of this talk is to sort of give you a sense of how much what people have made, uh, and of course, I'll limit mostly to what we have been doing in our group. And by answering some of these questions that you see here, that is one of them is, of course, can you use machine learning models to outperform physics models if you had sufficient amount of data? And this is a, a sort of a, a question that's sort of a trick question because in principle, these machine learning models are universal approximators. That means if you give them you know, infinite amount of data, unlimited amount of data, then they should be able to uh, map any function that you are uh, 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 that, that you want to emulate, but the question is: Given reasonable amount of data, can you sort of uh, the, the amount of data that is possible uh, to be obtained? Can you outperform physics-based models with or without incorporating physics uh, in, in, into these models? Uh, actually, without um, incorporating physics in the models. Now, the second question is: Can these KGML models, the one that involve knowledge, could they help? produce results that are physically consistent? Could they learn with limited observations? Could they generalize to novel testing scenarios? Could they provide novel insights? Could they even be helpful in situations where there are, there are no observations available? So there are, there are sample of questions that one could sort of ask within this context. And I'm gonna to try to answer some of them since the time is limited in the context of two applications. One of them is uh, being able to monitor the dynamics of temperature in a, in a lake, uh, and this is a work joint work uh, with USGS, uh, who is responsible for monitoring hundreds of thousands of lakes in the US. And they have data uh, for some of these lake observation data, uh, quite a bit of observation data for a couple of dozen lakes, moderate amount of data for a few hundred lakes, and then there are literally 95% of the lakes in for which they have absolutely no data whatsoever. They use a model called GLM, which is a physics-based model uh, in operation setting. Uh, it, it's, it's a pretty uh, close to the state of the art model. And, 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 and the question is, could uh, physics guided machine learning, knowledge guided machine learning help in this context? The other application that I'm gonna talk about somewhat more briefly uh, is being able to model 
a stream flow in a watershed, uh, it's like, it, can, can you replicate a hydrology model? You know, SWAT, I'll, I'll sort of talk about. So, so let me just try to first answer these questions in the context of this lake temperature modeling. And the idea here is that we have uh, at least some lakes um, uh, in the U.S. for which we have very uh, large amount of observation. <clears throat> and for those, would it be possible to build a machine learning model that could sort of um, look at the weather driver, could take the, the meteorological drivers like temperature, precipitation, wind speed, humidity, and such, and then use them to, to be able to figure out what the temperature of the lake should be at different depths. Uh, so this is like the dynamic, how, how the lake temperature is changing, which is apparently very important for the health of the lakes, the water quality, the, what kind of fish can live in those lakes and so forth. And this one could sort of treat it as a machine learning problem in which you have the training samples and the training samples, the input features are the weather drivers. The output features would be the temperature of the lake at different depths. And you can, you can build a model that will predict those temperatures at different depths. You have the observations, and then you can look at the difference between those predictions and observations and figure out the training loss. And uh, you, you can now optimize the parameters of your machine learning model by optimizing this training, by, by minimizing the training loss. And of course, you regularize it with the complexity of the model uh, to make sure it's generalized as well. So this, this thing <clears throat> works pretty good, except that there's two challenges. <clears throat> One of them is that if you want to use some of the state-of-the-art methods, like LSTMs and RNN, RNNs, especially like LSTMs, they need a lot of labels. You, uh, and, and the labels are scarce. You know, for some lakes in the U.S., we have lots of, la lots of labels, thousands of days for which we have observation data, but for many lakes, we have very little data, maybe dozens of days, less than 10 days, and so forth. <clears throat> the second uh, challenge is that the uh, prediction that you are making in this, um, uh, for the temperature in the lake could be physically consistent, and it could be physically consistent in many, many different ways. One of them would be the temperature corresponds to water density, and of course, that means the density that you predict uh, for at different levels should be such the density at the lower level should be higher than the upper level. And it's entirely possible to build machine learning models that may appear to reduce the training loss uh, quite a bit uh, more than the other, uh, quite a bit more even than the physical model, and yet the, uh, the density depth relationship might get violated. The other thing is this, this lake uh, temperature is changing because of the energy flux uh, coming in from the solar radiation and such. There's a flux going out because the, the, the water body is radiating some heat. And the difference between them is what determines uh, whether the, the, lake, the, the lake becomes warmer or, 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 or colder, which means the, as you predict the temperature on different days, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the flux in and flux out of the energy should match the, uh, the change in the energy, the energy budget of the lake. And they may or may not match if, if you're using a, 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 a machine learning model. So there are many, many ways this models can be physically inconsistent. So the first question is, can you sort of handle these problems? And one way to handle both of these problems is to be able to build a machine learning framework in which you add in the uh, training of the machine learning model a mechanism to add a physics-based loss. So you're looking at the training loss, which forces the observations to match the, uh, uh, the predictions to match the observations, uh, which is the training loss. You have a term which handles the complexity, but you add a third term which handles the physics-based loss, whether it's because of the energy conservation or other, other things. And again, in some cases, adding this loss term can be quite easy. In other cases, it can be quite difficult, but, but certainly if you can manage to do that, it should give you a mechanism uh, to, to make things consistent. The other, the other good thing about being able to add the physics-based loss is that it can allow us to do learning. It can it allow us to learn the model can, can allow this model to, to, to learn even on days on which there's no observation. So the previous, if you don't have a physics-based loss, your machine learning parameters can be tuned, can be adjusted only on days for which you have the observation. So you can see the prediction, and if they don't match the observation, you, use the, you take the loss and you propagate it backwards. But with the physics-based loss, even on days when there is no observation, you can still compute the physics-based penalty, and you can use that to uh, optimize the, uh, uh, the framework, so which, is, which is a big advantage. That is, uh, it allows us to learn on days in which there is no observation. So that's one part. And again, you see the structure here, an LSTM, which is sort of a advanced version of recurrent neural network, uh, which is uh, some sort of a memory. It, 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 allows us, it, it, it sort of allows us to sort of keep some memory in 
and how far back it goes in to, to learn from the previous uh, stake. Uh, and then you, if you look at this picture here, and if you ignore the blue part, it's a standard out of the box LSTM uh, that would be used for any application, including language translation uh, and many other things. And if you look at the blue part, that's the one that's being added onto it to compute the, uh, the energy fluxes and the state of the energy so you can keep track of them and, and use them to just figure out if there is a penalty that needs to be added because of the energy inconsistency. And again, the, the blue portions can be modified to include other aspects of the physical system. Now, this whole framework also gives us one more opportunity to handle the data sparsity challenge. And one of them is that even though observations may be sparse, but the physics models themselves can produce a lot of observations, just fake observations, synthetic observations. And of course, if those are the only observations we had, then the machine learning model that I'm using uh, to, to train with it cannot do any better than the physics models. And of course, that's what we are trying to improve upon. But if I have a small number of observations, I can still leverage the, the, the synthetic data, synthetic predictions produced by physics models, because I can use them to train the model to become close enough, machine learning models to be close enough to where it should be. And then I can use the observation to refine it. So this is like refinement Train with the physics models, uh, synthetic observations, and then you find them using observation. So th this actually works pretty good. Okay? So now I'm going to show you the combination of these things and sort of show you how well this actually performs in, in uh, the modeling of lake temperature dynamics in the context of uh, uh, Lake Mendota, and uh, uh, for which we have lots of observations. You know, it's a very highly observed lake. This is where one of the um, uh, major offices of data science and USGS is located in. So they actually observe this lake. They have observations going back about 30 years for quite a few days in each year. So we have thousands of observations, thousands of days of observations, and each day they know exactly what the temperature is of the lake at, at different depths. So if you take uh, this lake and if you take the GLM, uh, the, the, the physics model used by USGS, and if you use it using, if you, if you, if you have a standard version of this model that's being run on this lake, uh, it will have a very high error. If you look at the, the chart here, uh, the vertical column is RMSC, higher the lower the better, and of course, if you go up, it's lower. So in some sense, it's showing you RMSC going down. And you can see that if you start, uh, and if you try to in, parameterize the model, even using, uh, using a small number of observations or no observations, the error is high, pretty high, it's more than three degrees to centigrade. But as you calibrate this model, various parameters in this model using larger number of, uh, of training profiles, uh, then the error becomes smaller, it saturates around 1.8. So if you use about 1,000 days of data to, to train, it becomes much, much uh, smaller than, than what it would be without too many observations. Now, if I took this uh, lake, and because I have a lot of observations, I can also build an LSTM, the plain standard machine learning model, that just ignores any physics and just simply build a model, a uh, black box model. <clears throat> and this is how it, the model would perform. This is the orange curve that you see here. That is, if you have lots of observations, like thousands of observations, it actually it performs even better than the GLM. Uh, and I'm talking about building the model on a certain number of years and testing in other years. So basically, of the, of the observation period that we have, we use a you know, portion of it, about two-thirds of it for building the model. And the remaining one in both cases is being used for, for checking whether it does well or not. And but, but on the other hand, this black box model does extremely poorly if you have very few observations, in the sense that if you have you know fewer few days of data, even though on each data day you have you know observations at every depth, it can do much, much worse than a, a physics model, which is which is what you would expect. It's not a surprise. Now the the model that uses both machine learning and physics, which is the one in which I am trying to use the GLM to do the pre-training and then use the, a few small number of observations to, to refine and, of course, bring in the energy conservation and such. You can see that's the purple model, which is the process-guided uh, record of neural network uh, deep learning method. And the, the amazing power of that is that, that that method, even with very small number of observations, like as little as two days or two or three days, it actually would perform nearly as good <clears throat> as the, uh, the GLM uh, trains with thousands of observations. And if you give it you know, a couple of dozen days of data, then it's almost as good as anything, and it actually is, you know, it's really, really good. So this sort of tells you that, yes, there is a possibility of, of developing these models, at least in this domain, 
uh, and of course people have tried this idea in many, many other domains as well, that this, this bringing the notion of physics and machine learning together can actually beat either one of them. So this is, can I, can I handle, can I work with Spark data? <clears throat> now, next question one would be interested in is, how about um, handling scenarios that are out of sample? <clears throat> that means what if I'm looking at a scenario that has never been given <clears throat> to neither uh, the machine learning or the process guided models or the process guided machine learning model. So to create the scenario, <clears throat> uh, please focus on the second column here. The left column, uh, the two figures here, the left figure basically is showing a situation for all the three models, the um, plain uh, physics model, which is green, a plain a black box model, which is orange, and purple model, which is process guided machine learning model. And the left figure is telling you what happens to the performance of these three models if they're trained and tested in similar scenarios. That is, you take the 30 years of data, you use a subset of them for training, a random subset of them for training, and then and you test them in random subsets. So everything, uh, given that you're taking a random subset, they should be somewhat similar uh, between, um, between training and test. And the relative <clears throat> performance that you're seeing here is what we saw on the previous page because we have plenty of data in both of these cases. Now, in the right figure, what we are doing is we are hiding from all of these three uh, scenarios for all of these three algorithms any observations about summer. <clears throat> that is, summer observations are completely hidden for the entire data set for all the three algorithms. All of them are being trained using spring, fall, and winter, either synthetic observations, that will be the case for PGRNN, <clears throat> or real observations whenever they are available for GLM, and the and the G, uh, uh, for, for, and then for the GLM, the, uh, that will be the case for RNN. And for GLM, the parameter training will be done only using spring, fall, and winter. And then when you see that, you can see that the GLM, which is a physics model, performs poorly because it's, it's not being, its parameters are being chosen to match what happens in spring, fall, and winter, but it does not know what happens in the end in summer. The orange model, which is the plain black box machine learning model, does extremely poorly as expected, because it, it, is, it never saw any observations uh, from, from the summer. It only saw observations from spring, fall, and winter, and the winter, and then, of course, there's the summer in Wisconsin, for example, in Madison, where this lake is, its behavior is very different than in spring, fall, and winter. But the process-guided machine learning model, which learned only from the green model uh, without any observations, synthetic data sets, which is, which is its handicap, and yet it used only the observation from spring, fall, and winter to make corrections. Uh, it drops too, but very slightly, and the gap between the process model and the other ones actually becomes much bigger. So this actually shows you the power of, uh, of, of bringing machine learning and, and data science together. Now, the next slide is simply showing that, indeed, uh, this process-guided machine learning model, PGRNN, implemented with energy conservation loss, actually can match the, the flux in, flux out, which is being shown in the, in the green uh, the curve versus the, uh, uh, the blue curve, which is the change in the energy budget from one day to the next in the lake. And the green and blue curve match both for the physics model, which is, of course, is expected, and from the PGRNN reasonably well, uh, which is which is, it, it implements the energy conservation law. But if you use a standard black box, machine learning model, of course, those two don't match because it has no clue that that needs to be uh, controlled. All right, so now in the, in the last five minutes, I just want to talk about this other problem. I'll, I'll go through it rather quickly, but it sort of tells you uh, is, uh, different levels of complexities that uh, can come in as you're trying to bring in the, uh, the physical aspects of, 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 a, of a problem that you're trying to model into a machine learning model. And to motivate that, because that, that's, it's a much more complex problem in, in some ways than the, the physics model that we had uh, for, for monitoring lake temperature. So I'm looking at being able to predict a stream flow in a watershed, which is typically done by hydrological models. And uh, there are, you know, there's a lot of data available, of course, from observations as well. But for this um, you know, discussion here in the next five minutes, I'm going to uh, focus on a situation where we are looking at a river a watershed for which we have um, a pretty a large amount of data, uh, uh, synthetic data that's available 
by running the SWOT model, which is a hydrological model. Uh, uh, it basically, it uses the 1,000-year data for, uh, for the weather observations and creates a stream, a stream flow uh, prediction, uh, daily prediction for, uh, for over 1,000 years. So it's, it's effectively unlimited data. I mean, and the question is, can I build a, a, a deep neural network, something like an RNN or LSTM, what you saw before, that could take this data and make the prediction and can learn you know, to act like uh, SWAT does for, for this model. So a traditional approach that would sort of try to build a model for this would, would directly take these meteorological drivers, the weather inputs, and, and then try to sort of learn the stream flow um, using the standard approach. So that's, that's, that's a basic approach, okay? But if you think about it, this, this model is, of course, very complex. This is the, the weather, the, the, the weather drivers are not impacting just stream flow, but there are also, there are a whole bunch of other things that are involved. There is a, the soil, uh, which is accumulating water. There's a snowpack, which could be sort of contributing to the, the, the flow. There is a, there could be lateral flow. There could be base flow coming in from groundwater. There will be surface runoff. There's a whole bunch of physical variables that sort of are modeled in a complex physical system like a watershed. And a physics model would actually be, um, would, of course, they, they, they are actually emulating all of these uh, to get to the stream flow. So stream flow is only one of the components of this large physical system, and it's interconnected with a whole bunch of other things that sort of exist in the physical system. So, so the question is, given that SWAT um, is predicting all of these other variables, is it possible for me to build a machine learning model that would try to simultaneously model all of these variables that are interrelated? And, and of course, why? Um, uh, because I, perhaps I may be able to use that, this, this more complex interrelated model, it's, 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 it's a more complex problem for me to model all of these variables, but maybe it would be sort of more realistic. It would be sort of, it would perhaps give me more understanding of what's happening at the bottom. So that's one thing I could do to bring in the physical aspects of the system. Second thing is these variables that you're, that are you observing in the, in the nature, in the, in the physical system, there are different types. And, and again, they can be different in many, many different ways. But in, in, in a hydrological system, you can sort of see very quickly that some of these variables are fluxes. That is, they're just happening, you know, that they're changing at a, at a pretty rapid rate. And some of them are straight, uh, like soil water. Soil water doesn't change very quickly. It's a state that builds over a period of time. Same thing with snowpack. So does it pay to differentiate between these variables and treat them differently? So that's another question one could ask. The other thing is that these variables have dependencies between them. They're not just inter they're not just, they're not just, uh, just a collection of independent variables. Can I leverage this dependency into account? Fourth thing is that these variables also provide me some sort of ability to, to think about cons constraints of the mass conservation. So for example, precipitation minus evapotranspiration minus stream flow uh, must uh, it's like it must sort of be the, the the quantity that tells me how much water is changing in the soil. So, so there are sort of uh, conservation laws that you can sort of define based upon uh, these different pieces. So, so what I'm just showing in, in my sort of last slide here is 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 sort of an incomplete work, but but it's sort of work in progress. That if I had taken this data in which I took thousand years of relation, effectively very large amount of data. I use first 600 years for training, last 400 years for testing, and again, the weather data is coming here from a simulator. And and if and all of these results sort of that I'm showing you are sort of done for the exact same setting. And now, if I build a basic standard uh, LSTM, the kind that you saw in the, in the previous slides, it has certain RMSC, it has certain error between what is observed and and what is predicted. You know, and the number is 0.63. But if I try to take the first aspect of the physical system into account, that is, I'm trying to simultaneously model the interrelated variables, and actually, if I do it in a simple-minded way, the error goes up because if I'm trying to optimize many things, a machine learning algorithm does worse. But if you optimize them in an intelligent way together, the error goes down, which is a progress. If I try to keep into account the fact that some of these variables are states and some of them are fluxes, and then as a result, design the architecture differently, and I'm covering a lot of sort of ground here without getting any details, the error goes down even more. And if I take into account the, the hierarchical structure or the interconnectivity into account, 
and, and, and build that into the architecture, the gather goes down even more. So basically, you can see, and then this sort of this thing sort of keeps going down as we, as we uh, have more and more uh, addition to the physical system here, and it, it sort of shows that there are many many different ways of bringing in the physical aspect of the system into machine learning uh, beyond just modifying the loss function or uh, or doing the pre-training. Okay, so with that, given that we started late, I would sort of try to finish uh, 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 quickly now. There is this paradigm of uh, machine learning being guided by scientific knowledge uh, appears to be very promising for addressing the limitation of pure machine learning models or pure process-guided approaches. And the exciting research that's happening in this, in, in, in this direction all involves how do you incorporate complex physical knowledge? You know, and again, you saw some examples of it. Uh, how do you take this knowledge and incorporate them into model learning, model architectures, complex physical systems have multiple components, how do you account for them, how do you account for the relationships? Uh, and, and again, you saw a very you know, um, simple attempt at, at, in, in the previous few slides. How do you make use of the real-time observation data? Like, you know, people do data simulation, for example, in the, in, the, in the weather world. How do you bring in aspects like these in machine learning framework, which, of course, uh, you know, work with the input drivers as opposed to assimilating the observation on the fly. So with that, let me stop. And there are some publications here uh, that sort of cover this work. We held a workshop for uh, our research group um, um, back in um, August, which was sort of broadly on this topic and was covered topics like, you know, including weather and climate, hydrology, aquatic sciences, and transgender biology. All of the talks that are this workshop are available from this workshop website. Uh, through a YouTube channel, so you know it's just uh, for uh, people to check on. All right, with that, I'm going to stop and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was 30 minutes right on the mark. So I think um, with the time, since we had the technical difficulties, we'll allow the Q and A to go on for the entire hour. So let's take 20 minutes for Q and A from the public. Um, reminder to use the raise your hand button if you have a question or you can type it into the chat box and I'll read the question out loud. Um, all right, a question from Katie Dagon. Uh, she says, thanks for the talk. Do you have thoughts or ideas on approaches to uncertainty quantification for physics informed machine learning? Uh, very good question. We haven't worked anything on this. I guess the, the key question is uncertainty quantification is extremely important uh, in physical settings. So the question is, what does it mean uh, for this KGML model? Uh, and if you would see that the machine learning community sort of has played limited attention to the uncertainty quantification, uh, although there's a lot more interest in, in in seeing as to what happens if you perturb the, the model parameters uh, and, and how, what happens if you perturb the input uh, variables. Uh, and the Concern has been mostly to make the models more robust. But what we are finding ourselves in our own work is that if you sort of even do that simple perturbation of the sign, which is really not meant for uncertainty quantification, it gives you, of course, different sort of results. But if you take those results and if you ensemble them, then the performance get dramatically better uh, in, in the sense that so there is a so there's uncertainty in these machine learning models in the in the structure, and if you leverage that and ensemble it, uh, you can improve the performance. So, so I guess what I'm saying is that our community hasn't really contributed much to the field except to sort of say that there's an opportunity here to improve the prediction. And of course, there's an opportunity here to use the traditional method methodologies for quantifying uncertainty. Uh, Tom, do you want to go ahead with your questions? I know you always have a lot. Okay, thank you for a great talk. Uh, maybe I'll start with my first questions. I was wondering, so how do you deal with the fact that your physical constraint may not be exactly verified of, in observations of your target variables? For example, observations of your lake, uh, you know, you may not exactly verify the state of equa um, the the equation of state for density or for your stream flow. Sometimes it's hard to close mass conservation in observations. That's perfect. Perfect question. Actually. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, so basically, um, um, let's just look at the situation of uh, energy conservation uh, uh, loss here, right? You know, there's a flux of energy coming in, flux of energy going out. 
which is what is the uh, what's reflected in the green term that you see here. Now, the energy flux in and all, especially the energy flux that's coming in, is being computed using the observations, and the observations are inexact, which means. Um, which means there are certain variables that are sort of being used here to compute this equation, which are not necessarily correct. That means you may be sort of thinking the, the temperature on a certain day is so much, but actually it could be a little bit different than what it is. So, which means if you use this term precisely, uh, you actually would be guiding the model in the wrong direction, in which we actually see that. So if you are trying to um, balance the uh, friction loss, Basically, the, the the loss, the error, error, you know, basically the loss, loss due to the, the prediction uh, difference between prediction and observation, and the loss because of the energy conservation. And if you sort of say, well, I'm going to just keep on focusing on the energy loss at infinitum, eventually your performance uh, for um, generalization actually becomes worse in the sense that the out of sample generalization it becomes worse and worse. So we we do sort of two things to handle this problem. One of them is one of them sort of is a heuristic that we sort of say, well, we can only be certain about our observations uh, to a certain level, which means if the energy, if this energy loss term is a smaller, if the energy difference is smaller than a certain value, then you're not going to penalize it. So basically, you compute the energy difference, and if it's, it's supposed to be zero, if, if, if the energy is conserved, it's supposed to be zero. But if it's small enough, we skip, we, we, we skip that loss in the sense that if I, if I look at this, uh, physics-based loss, it won't be sort of, it won't sort of be impacting the adjusting function if the physics-based loss happens to be smaller than a certain quantity. That's one uh, thing that helps a lot. The second thing is, you, you we have to use some sort of a, uh, um, uh, it, it, we have to sort of calibrate hyperparameters to make sure that we we basically decide how important the training loss versus how important the physics loss, because these are Two completely different terms. You have to compute a relative difference between them, relative right? importance between them, and that relative importance is computed using a, some sort of hyperparameter optimization, which is standard technique in machine learning. So, which means if you if, you, if you're using two thirds of the data for training and one third for testing, then what you do is for the two thirds of the data that you're using for training, or you use you hide part of it for hyperparameter tuning, and those are the parameters that are used to figure out how much importance you want to give to one of these losses versus the other. And does that answer your question? Uh, maybe the quick follow-up question would be, so you mentioned a hyperparameter. I'm assuming, for example, is a weight given to physical constraints in your loss. Um, so how do you deal with the fact that there is a necessary trade-off if you increase that weight with, between performance and physical constraints? And so do you, in, your, like in, in the results you show, it was very, very promising. You always gain performance when you incorporated physical constraints, but have you ever uh, met situations where there was a trade-off that is enforcing physical constraints wasn't necessarily decreasing the error of your algorithm? Yes, 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 yeah. So so basically, th those were the surprises. So, you know, they basically when we sort of uh, implemented the physics based loss right on right the top, and if you don't do the proper op optimization, uh, then the 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 accuracy in out of sample in, in the test sample was actually worse in the sense that the performance is worse than without including the loss. So the first optimization that we had to do was that do not bring in the loss unless it's large enough. That means if the, the difference in the energy, uh, the flux of energy in and out versus the change in the, the energy budget of the lake is too high, if it's too small, just don't, don't bother. That, that is small unit, the, the folks at USGS sort of said, well, if it's less than that, don't worry about it because you don't know whether you're computing it correctly. So that was one part. The second part was that if you don't use the proper hyperparameters, if you don't use this set aside data to select what the value of the hyperparameter is, then your your performance can be really, really bad. So I mean, in the sense that you can do very well on the training data, but you would do very poorly on the test data. So so what you're talking about, would you see poor performance? Of course it does, it does happen, which is why you, you must do hyperparameter optimization. Yeah, thank you. That answers my question. Let's go back to the chat. There's a question from Shengzhen Chen. Uh, thank you for your talk. 
Could you go back to the slides showing the equation of the loss? I am wondering, could you please explain more about the loss equation? Okay, all right. So, so if you look at this equation, it has three different terms. If it was a standard plane of a regression, you would only see the very first term. That is, you, you, if, you do, if you do standard regression, you're basically, uh, um, you're computing a sort of weight that optimize the, uh, the difference between what you predict and what is actual. Uh, and the log happens to be typically the, the L2 log. Okay, but, but, but in, in the machine learning, if you're trying to build a model that generalizes to something that you haven't seen before, you must also try to add a term that sort of handles the model complexity. So this is the second term here. So the idea here is that the model that is less complex but gives you equally about equal amount of error or even slightly greater amount of error, perhaps is better uh, than a, another model, which is far more complex, but gives you le less error. So the first term is sort of trying to make sure the predictions are close to the observation. The second term is trying to make sure that the model doesn't become too complex. And the third term is watching for the fact that the result that you're producing would be inconsistent. And in this particular case, inconsistence could be defined in terms of energy conservation, if you're looking, looking at the, uh, the late temperature dynamics, or whether the depth and density meet a sort of a monotonic relationship, or if I'm trying to do the hydrological modeling that I saw, saw before, there are multiple variables you're trying to emulate in the system and the relationship between them, and you're trying to check whether the relationship exists. And each of these terms, you, so basically each of the last terms, you want it to be zero. And if, so basically all of these terms, you want them to be as small as possible. And, and, and you don't know how to create a weight, respective weight for each one of them. That is, they're all terms of very different kinds because training loss is trying to figure out the differences in prediction and the observation. Uh, the middle term is trying to talk about the complexity of the model, which is a completely different base. And, then, and the physics-based law is, again, yet another beast which, has, which can have multiple parameters, uh, components in it. Each one of them can sort of have a constant in front of them, which tells you how much weight you should give to them. And because you don't know what that weight should be, you, use, you hide part of the training data to check whether uh, some combination of those weights would give you better results than the other one. That's actually very similar to the way parameters are learned in physics models. So hopefully this gives you the explanation, but let me know if, if, you, um, if this does not answer your question. I was wondering if I could jump in. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, so I was wondering if you could comment on whether you think these physics constraints resolve problems with not having enough data, which seemed to be the case in your first example. In the second case, it sounded like you had a thousand year simulation, which seems like a like a data for for training this problem. So um I'm just kind of wondering, is it is this mainly about not enough data or is it about the fact that the data generating processes has these constraints in it and therefore makes the training data like a bit less learnable? Yeah, so, so very good question. So, so in the, the last example shows that even though in principle, a machine learning model, which is universal approximator should be able to learn the behavior uh, of, of something like SWAT, but what you're looking at here is that even with thousands of years of data, which is a lot of data, thousand years times uh, 320, 365 days, that's a lot of data. And actually, these experiments were done with 200 years of data versus thousand years of data. And again, the, the numbers didn't change very much. So this, this, is, this was to show that the physical models have a lot of complexity inside them. And if you treat them just like a black box, you're probably putting a huge burden on the, um, on the machine learning model to learn how to emulate that. So what you're seeing here in, in these four rows is the first row is the plain black box machine learning model. The second, third, and fourth have not brought in any energy conservation issues or any or mass conservation issues at all. They're just trying to incorporate the structure of the problem inside the model. And, and, and the kind of thing that people would not do in, in a typical machine learning setup, you know, because basically, these models will take variables and the variables are what they are. And of course, the idea is that machine learning models should be able to figure them out just by looking at the data that it has. 
And it turns out that uh, trying to understand the nature of these different variables, the relationship and the fact that there are multiple, uh, a physical system can be observed in, 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 in some multiple perspectives uh, and, 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 and taking all of them into account actually can be, can be very useful. So this is a case in which you, have, you can have a lot of data, and I suspect that if you created, uh, if you went from 1,000 years of data to 10,000 years of data, almost nothing would change. You know, you know again, at, at some point, if you have massive monitoring, billions of years of data, perhaps, perhaps with the LSTM would, would sort of learn to figure out uh, all of the biases that are sort of, um, uh, that it, it hasn't figured out yet. But this, this sort of shows that yes, as you bring in more of the structure of the physical more physical system, uh, uh, the machine learning model's job becomes easier and easier. In some sense, this is sort of showing you another recipe for bringing in quote unquote physics of the problems inside machine learning. Okay, thank you. I think we have six minutes left for questions. Um, I, I have a question, kind of a follow up question. So, uh, there, uh, in terms of like uh, getting the third term there, uh, there are a lot of like physical constraints that can be applied. But uh, which one is going to be most effective, or which which combination of like set of constraints are going to be more effective? Um, so that need to be like manually or really based on like domain knowledge and to like try different uh, constraints and di or different combinations of them. Or is there a uh -huh. like, smarter way to, to do that? Very good question. Very very good question. And again. All of this has to be sort of explored, but generally the idea would be that you would want to make your machine learning model as physically consistent as possible. Uh, and and for example, for the uh, for the lake monitoring, the first thing that we tried uh, when we started this work with USGS uh, was simple ways of bringing in machine learning and 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 uh, physics model together through residual modeling, a process that is used that has been used very extensively going back as, as far back as 20 years, in the sense that the people use the, the notion of visual modeling, uh, you, you try to compute it, you try to model the error uh, uh, between the output of the physics model and the observations, and you use that to sort of make the correction. And if, if when we did that, we very quickly realized that even though it's bringing physics and machine learning together, to, uh, it was actually producing results that were physically inconsistent uh, in terms of density depth relationship. So our first talk was to sort of see can you bring that in, and the moment we brought that in, it actually improved the performance for many lakes that were not so hard to model. The lakes that uh, sort of are well mixed in the uh, terminology that people use at USGS. That is, the temperature of the vertical column is pretty much the same at all the time. It, it could be cooler or warmer, but it's pretty much the same from top to bottom. But then there are some stratified lakes in which the upper and lower part of the temp lakes could be a different temperature. And those are much harder lakes to model from their perspective. And in those, uh, that technique uh, 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 alone was not doing good enough. So that's where we brought in the energy conservation. Uh, and, and if you put them together, of course, things become even better. And the biggest improvement, another big improvement came in from the fact that we could pre-train uh, these uh, uh, machine learning models using physics models synthetic data, which is plenty of work. And then only small amount of observations is used. So, so what, what I'm saying that more you put in the physics, the better it is. And, and the slide that you're seeing, I, I hope you can. Can you still see my slide number 25? Yes. Yep. Okay. So if you look at the slide, what you're seeing here is as you go from the top row to the lower rows, as you go down to lower and lower rows, you're adding more and more physics into it. And, and our experience has been that more, uh, more physics are merrier in the sense that we have tried all of the all many many different combinations here of these things. There is more of the physical constraints you bring in, uh, the stronger the performance become of the machine learning framework, provided you sort of bring that in properly. And again, this is, as I said, work in progress in the slide that you're seeing here. We still have not incorporated physical constraints. Uh, that's work in progress. Uh, um, but but if, if you look at the other three categories, one, two, and three, each one of them individually helps and each one of combination of each one of them helps. So that means more of the physics relevance you bring in, the better it is. 
so I think we can end the webinar here. Uh, so thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Vipin, for your presentation today. Um, so thank we'll you, conclude the webinar. As I said earlier, a recording will be shared later next week. Um, and then coming up in two weeks on January 25th, we will have a talk by Karthik Kashnath of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So we hope to see you at that talk. And thank you everyone for joining.